Welcome back, everyone. I'm really delighted to introduce Hod Lipson. Thank you. So I want to talk today about a taboo topic in robotics, a topic that you'll never hear about anywhere else, and that is robotic self-awareness. It's a topic that we're forbidden from talking about in the circles of robotics. Uh, it's one of those really big challenges, and I'm kind of surprised because self-awareness, consciousness, is one of, these, one of the three big questions of origin, and the other two being the origin of life and the origin of the universe. And we've made quite a bit of progress on the origin of the universe and the origin of life, and we have pretty interesting and simple theories that explain almost everything, but when it comes to consciousness, self-awareness, the reason we're all here talking to each other and thinking about things, we've made relatively little progress. It's sort of the elephant in the room when it comes to robotics. Now, we've been fascinated with this for a century, at least, or for more. We've been trying to build these amazing robots that are self-aware. This is Mars 1939. <laughs> this is... Uh, uh, New York, uh, Queens, the best and the brightest are gathered to look at the best that robotics can offer. This is a robot that can walk, can talk, and can light a cigarette. Okay, what else is there? What is there? It, it looked like it's game over, right? Uh, that's it, but, but you know, uh, it's just a machine. It's just a machine, right? It's not conscious, it can, it can do all these things, but it's not really anything. So. But the strange thing is that we're fascinated by this topic. There is not a single sci-fi movie that doesn't have a self-aware robot in it. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, <laughs> sometimes they're complicated. Self-awareness is a really complicated thing. I understand the creator of uh, Westworld is here. Uh, self-awareness can be very, very complicated. And yet, we've made no progress on it. And it's a taboo topic for reasons I don't understand. I started my career in robotics thinking I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on one of these, on this big question. Surely people have figured a lot of this out. And I Googled it and the page came blank. When it comes to robotic self-awareness, all you get is sci-fi and philosophy, but you get, you get ethics, but you don't get any substantial information about is it possible, do we have a theory, do we know how to build it, what is it? In fact, as I was starting my career in this, uh, as an assistant professor a thousand years ago, a, uh, a colleague came to me and said, you know, you shouldn't uh, be working on consciousness. Uh, you shouldn't be talking about the C word, he said. It's, uh, it's both fluffy and impossibly difficult. And you won't get anywhere. And as he walked away, he also told me, and you won't get tenure either. <laughs> All right, so that was enough. And I, I did other things, and I you know, try to make robots that do backflips and all kinds of other cool things, but it nagged to me, can we make progress in this thing? And, you know, and there's no excuses. We have computing power. Uh, people said, oh, it's just a matter of computing power, then you get self, no, it's, we have computing power that's more than what most, that many other animals have. We, we have a lot of, other things, but we have no clue how to make this. In fact, if you look at Moore's Law today, this is gigaflops per dollar compared to 120 years. This is real data. Uh, it's, uh, it's embarrassing that we haven't made progress in this area. Look at where we are today compared to 2012, 10 years ago, almost indistinguishable from 1950s. They could say they don't have enough computing power, but we do. What is it? What's missing? We have made incredible progress in deep learning and we can tell the difference between a cat and a dog and all kinds of amazing things that have transformed every aspect of every industry and every market. But we're no closer to making intelligent self-aware machines. Sure, we can make robots that can do backflips and incredible things, but nobody would claim that this robot is happy <laughs> having accomplished this thing. It's not even enjoying this. So what is it about emotions and can we do this? Some people tell me, okay, it's about art. Robots are not gonna be self-aware until they can create art. Um, although somebody told me 
a little bit high, I think he, he came and told me, you don't need to be self-aware to create art. That's an <laughs> interesting, uh, uh, but, but I built a robot uh, that pays. This is a robot I have in my living room, uh, and it creates art. In the beginning, it wasn't very good, but it's learning. It's creating pretty amazing things on its own. This is a, this is a painting of my cat right there created by this robot. I cannot paint my way out of a paper bag, so I'm not teaching it how to paint. It's learning on its own. It's actually on a, uh, it's walking through New Delhi right now in Google Street View, and I don't know what it's gonna paint when I come back home. So it's it kind of interesting uh, to see, but people, it creates art, but it's still not anywhere close to sort of enjoying the art, right? Um, I, uh, I recently gave a talk in Brooklyn about uh, robotic art, and I was booed off the stage. Uh, not because I said my robot creates art, but because I said my robot was, was an artist. Because there's something that we hold very dear about creativity and about emotions. And this idea that a machine can have emotions is almost sacrilegious. So what is it? We can make robots that can fake emotions, like these robots over here that are actually supposed to look at me, but they're looking at you for some reason. <laughs> They track, they make emotions, they, they make faces. There's ma something magical about a robot that smiles at you, but it's still faking it. So people tell me, okay, you can make robots that can fake emotions, robots that can detect emotions, that can scan for it, that can do all these things, but can robots ever have emotions? So we lump all these things under this term sentience. Emotions, self-awareness, consciousness, feelings. Can robots have that? Now, uh, philosophers have been debating this for millennia. Theologians, psychologists, we've all been thinking about this, but I'm afraid we haven't made a lot of progress. I was on a panel recently talking about self-awareness, uh, and next to me was a renowned uh, philosopher, and he, and he said, uh, when it came his time to define it, he said, but, but self-awareness is nothing but the canvas of reality. And everybody nodded. <laughs> canvas of reality. Yes, it, it sounds good, it's poetic, it's it kind, of, kind of half true, but it doesn't help me build robots. I don't know how to take that and translate it into a meaningful thing. And you know, there's this saying that if you don't, you don't really understand something until you can teach it to somebody else. So in engineering, we say, you don't really understand something until you can build it. And so the question for me is, okay, canvas of reality, how do I build the canvas of reality? What is it? So we went with a completely different definition, a very practical engineering definition of self-awareness. I'm gonna tell you what this definition is today. You ready? The origin of self-awareness is the ability to imagine yourself in the future. That's it the ability to imagine yourself in the future. So if you can imagine yourself on the beach tomorrow, if you can hear the waves, if you can smell the ocean, if you can feel the sand under your feet, in the future, you're imagining yourself, you're self-aware. Uh, now, uh, not, you know, it's not a black and white thing. A dog can probably already taste this food before it's tasting it. So a dog can imagine itself into the future, but the question is how far into the future? A dog can probably imagine a few minutes into the future. So a dog will save and bury a bone. We can imagine ourselves into retirement, so we save for retirement. We can imagine ourselves into the future with incredible fidelity, lots of different ways, and we can see ourselves in the future, and that, I argue, is what self-awareness is, and it's not just a philosophical thing, it's an incredible evolutionary advantage. If you need to cross this river here, you can imagine where you're gonna put your feet, where you're gonna step. You can see yourself crossing this thing. You can look at this tree here, and you can imagine how you're gonna climb it. You can already see where you're gonna grab, where you're gonna, uh, where you're gonna hold, where you're gonna step. Even though you've never climbed this tree before, you can plan in your head and make decisions about things in advance because you can simulate yourself. Now, a skeptic will say, well, we've had simulators and robots for eternity. In fact, every single robot 
out there started its life in simulation. Nobody builds a robot and turns it on. We always simulate it first. So what's new? You're talking about simulation in robotics. In fact, I'd argue that a lot of the results, if not all of the results we've seen here today in previous Mars and other venues, all started in simulation. So robots always begin their life in simulation, and it doesn't matter what kind of robot and where it's going, all accomplishments in robotics today start in simulation. So the question is, what's different? And what's different is, the big question is, where does that simulation come from? You see, robots right now begin their life in a simulation created by a human, by teams of human engineers, whereas we begin in a simulation created by ourselves. What do we do in the scrib when we play around? It looks like frivolous activity, but I argue that we are now, as babies, we are building a simulation of ourselves. And this is an incredible evolutionary advantage. In fact, I, I, I guess that the more a species plays, spends time, spends time playing, the more self-aware it is. So that's, uh, that's uh, sort of the, the beginning of the process. And so we took this definition and we started to build robots that learn not to do interesting things or, or do useful tasks, but to learn what they are. And so here's an example of one of our first robots a couple years ago. Uh, it's uh, interesting, simple four-legged machines, can't do bath flips, can't fly to Mars, can't do anything useful. Uh, and on top of that, it is blind, can't see the world. But it has a couple of sensors that tell it how it's tilted left and right, forward and backward. And uh, it has uh, eight motors, two on the hip, one on the hip, one on the knee of every foot. Uh, and it needs to learn to walk. But it's going to do that not by doing trial and error, but by learning what it is. So in the beginning, uh, so it just babbles a little bit like a baby in a crib. And then it begins to figure out what it is. And we're peeking into its brain right now. We can visualize how the robot is seeing itself. And in the beginning, it has no clue if it's a snake, a spider, a, a robotic arm. It doesn't know what it is. But two days into the cycle, it's beginning to realize that it has four legs. It doesn't quite know how they're connected and where. But four days into the process of babbling, it begins to realize it has four legs. It's not quite. Uh, the legs are not connected in the right place. They're not exactly the, the, the correct length. But that self-image, the ability to imagine itself, to simulate itself, allow this robot to learn how to walk. And here it is walking in simulation. And here it is walking for the first time in reality. Now, we were hoping to get an evil spidery walk. But instead, we get this lame way of moving forward. But still. <laughs> Still, this is amazing to me that the robot figured out how to walk at all without doing any physical trial. So to test this, we did something very cruel. We plucked off a leg, as scientists do, and we watched what happened. Uh, the ro we play this video, please. Uh, and uh, the robot initially doesn't know uh, what happened. And it looks like this video is not playing. But if this is an amazing video that you're not going to see, uh, and uh, this robot begins to walk. It doesn't know what happens. Uh, and then gradually, it begins its self-image doesn't match reality. So it adapts its self-image. And then it, learned, it begins to limp. It forms an adapted uh, self-model and begins to limp forward uh, as, uh, as it moves. And, uh, and, it's, and, and, and it, it still moves forward. So, and we did put the leg back again, so everything's, the robot is happily retired. In my office, there's no, uh, uh, no liability around this, so everything's OK. So it's, it's uh, uh, amazing to me to see how these robots can learn. Now, if you do this many times, you get some interesting insight into how robots see themselves. Uh, you can see here uh, the origin there. And the blue dots are what a random ro uh, controller will do on this robot. The uh, white dots are where the robots that are self-aware believe they're going to get to if they walk in a particular way. And the yellow dots are where they actually get to in physical reality. So you can see that, like anything else in academia, this robot has an inflated self-image. <laughs> it believes it can do twice as much that it really can. But nevertheless, 
uh, despite having inflated self-image, it allows it, this inflated image allows it to make the right kind of decisions. And this is very interesting for me that this idea that the self model, it doesn't have to be, unlike a simulation that we're, as engineers are obsessed with accuracy, a self model doesn't have to be accurate, it just has to allow you to make the right kind of decisions. And I think evolution has optimized our ability to see ourselves for that purpose. Not for accuracy, not for precision, but for uh, to allow us to make the right decision. And it's interesting that a deflated self-image prevents the robot from walking at all. So a little bit of insight into uh, ego and all these other things that we can get through this window of robotics. So that was a few years ago. Uh, since then, of course, AI has moved on in leaps and bounds. And we can, in the previous uh, project, we had to tell the robot about Newtonian mechanics. It only had to discover what it is given mechanics. But now we took another robot Again, not a fancy robot, doesn't do backflips or go to Mars, uh, but we allowed it, in a, without telling it anything about itself, to, to figure out what it is in the beginning. You see it's, it's babbling uh, in the phantom there in the background. You can see it doesn't quite know what it is, but here it is uh, after about a day of training. You can see the phantom is what it thinks it is. And you can see the reality. We overlay these two things. And you can see that even though the phantom the self-image isn't precise. It allows this robot to do something uh, and plan using its phantom image. And this is really important because it can learn how to do this pick and place task without doing any physical trials. It can learn that all inside its self-image. Just like you can do something new you've never done before and get it right for the first time because you thought about it a lot in and you kind of ran it for it inside your simulation. Uh, so uh, we even took this robot again, and we, we did something cruel again. We took a piece and we bent it. And we watched what happened. The robot very quickly finds out the reality and its self-image don't match. It babbles a little bit, adapts its self-image, and it then moves right along, continuing with this task. So you can see sort of that it's kind of becoming practical also for robotics. I'll show you one more example. Uh, this is uh, a robot that, uh, these are, actually I'm going to do this live demo, hopefully this is going to work. We have two robots, uh, one of them uh, self-aware and one of them not. And it's, uh, you know, again, this, this is not a robot that's going to wake up and say hello or like in the movies. It's self-aware in a tiny way, right, like a worm might be self-aware. But we have two robots. Uh, the green robot, uh, they both spend exactly the same amount learning how to, of time learning how to walk. The green robot uh, does an hour and a half of training of learning how to walk in physical reality. Of trials and error, reinforcement learning, all that kind of stuff. And as any roboticist will tell you, an hour and a half is not a lot of time for a robot to learn how to walk. Right? This is really hard. But it still makes an effort. The black robot spends exactly the same amount of time, the same amount of effort, the same amount of data collected in the physical world. But it doesn't use that data to learn how to walk. It uses that data to form an image of itself. Once it has an image of itself, it can learn to walk and spend a lot of time in its own simulation learning how to walk. In fact, it can learn other things. It can learn how to jump and do turns and do all kinds of things. Because once you have a simulation of yourself, you can do amazing things. So I'm going to turn them both on, and they'll both uh, move forward. And again, this one, I'll turn them on the same time. So you can have a race, and we can see how far they get. Yes. So this is what you get from one and a half hours of training to learn how to walk. And this is a better use of data. You take that same amount of data, exactly, one to one, and you use it to create a self-image. Now, of course, if you had an infinite amount of data, uh, you could do an even better job. So what we did, we were really interested in understanding what is the ratio, what is the, to quantify the benefit of self-modeling? What is the a benefit of being able to uh, imagine yourself? So this is the, a simulation version of this one. We did this for lots of different situations, and we found out an interesting thing. So here's progress compared to how many trials you're allowed to do in the physical world, so how much data you can collect. If you 
uh, don't have a self-model. If you have enough data, you can do pretty well. Uh, if you don't have enough data, you sort of use your data and you get to where you get. But the interesting is that if you only have a small amount of data, that gap is huge in terms of what you can do with that data. If you have an infinite amount of data, you sort of outperform or you reach the same level. So that gap is the value add of being able to imagine, your, for the robot to being imagining yourself. And we're interested to see how that scales because we, just, we don't want to just stop here. We want to see how far it goes. So we took this robot and we changed it a little bit so that it has fewer degrees of freedom. In other words, it's a simpler robot. So when you take a simpler robot that has only eight degrees of freedom, the difference between them is not as big. Uh, in other words, the advantage is not as profound. You take an even simpler robot with only four degrees of freedom, the advantage of, a, of being able to imagine yourself is almost negligent. So the message here is clear. We did this on lots of different robots and lots of shapes and sizes and situations and tasks. And you see is the more complex the system is, the more advantageous it is to be able to imagine yourself. This is an incredible gift that evolution gave us. It didn't give this gift to simpler organisms, but for complex organisms like us that have all these degrees of freedom, can do all kinds of things, the ability to imagine ourselves is incredible. You can see here the factor of improvement for a simple robot is, you know, this is the baseline of one factor, improve, factor improvement one, uh, but you can see even a simpler robots get, get an advantage. A robot with 16 or 17 degrees of freedom, we're talking about an advantage of a factor of five or six. It's a huge advantage in terms of evolution. And for us humans that we have, you know, thousands of degrees of freedom as in abilities, this is probably an incredible advantage compared to having to do things by trial and error. And for those of you who are technical who are wondering how this is different than conventional reinforcement learning, I'll just say that in conventional machine learning, we build a model of everything. And that model is trained with data and we move forward. We call it, sometimes we call it the Q. And the only thing we did here is we separated that model into two sub-models, a model of the self and the model of everything else. And the reason this is useful is because you might need to learn a new model of the world for every new task, but the model of the self is, 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 is constant across all tasks and all situations. If you have to think about one thing that is constant about all your experiences in life, it's you. And if you can model yourself, you take that big piece of this complexity out of the equations and you only have to model other things. It's an incredible evolutionary advantage. So I'll show you one last thing. This is still unpublished, but, 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 uh, but getting there, uh, we went on to create a sort of probabilistic model of self, not a model that predicts where the foot are gonna be or how to walk and all that, a probabilistic model uh, that just, you give it the state of the robot and uh, it tells you where, where the robot is. It's sort of like if you close your eyes and try to imagine where you are in space, uh, this is what the robot sees. And to me, this is, this is as exciting as, uh, as uh, probably landing from uh, uh, going to outer space to see this moment where for the first time I can see how a robot sees itself. This is a very simple robot. It's nowhere close to human level of consciousness, but it's the beginning of a machine that can see itself. So I've shown you a couple examples of robots that learn to imagine themselves increasingly complex, starting from stick figures to neural networks that predict their kinematics and so on to actual deeper systems that actually where the robot is beginning to have a notion of where its body is and wh what it is and what it can and can't do and so on. So a lot of sort of uh, a beginning, as you say, day one of self-awareness really not going, uh, we're still very, very, these are very, very simple models, but I think they're, they're on the path of this complexity. So you'll see a lot of these demos uh, later on from the students who've actually built this thing. Uh, and, uh, but I want to mention one personal angle to this. So we all have our dreams of what we want to do and where we want to go. My childhood dream was to meet an alien. I read every single book about UFOs and Bermuda Triangle and Area 51 and fantasized about this idea that maybe one day I'll meet an intelligent species. What it will be like? How do they think? What do they think about the world when they can see in colors we can't see? And, 
hear frequencies we can't hear and go places we can't go? What do they know? What would their art and poetry be like? What will their emotions be like? Now today, I know that I'm probably not gonna meet an alien species coming out of space, but I will probably meet an intelligent species, except that it will come not from the outside, but we will build it. Thank you.